that last song that we sang, the promise that it refers to is definitely a promise that I hold on to. And the reason being is because like each one of us, how we could relate to something when we put effort in and it feels like our effort is rejected or misunderstood. I mean, God promises us that our efforts will never go in vain. He promises us that whatever we sow, that we will reap. And if we sow into the Spirit, then we'll reap life. If we sow into the flesh, we reap death. This is, this is the cause and effect of the way that God has things set up. And today I want to talk about something. It's not about God drawing near to us, even though that is so amazing. Our first verse is going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. This isn't going to be our main verse that I want to uh, really uh, focus on. Ephesians chapter 2. Amen? Amen. 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 Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8 and verse 9. And we'll just keep this in mind as we go through the, uh, the message today. Amen? Verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's not as a result of works that no one should boast. It's a free gift of God. Amen? Amen. And now I want to talk about something. I got a question for you. If I pulled out my hand and said, I got a gift for you, it might be a bug. It might be something valuable like a diamond. It also might be nothing. And so, if we go through and I say, whatever is in each hand is a free gift. Okay? You with me so far? It's a gift. If sister over here says, I choose left hand. Okay, cool. Here's your gift. Get a nickel. Okay, cool. She goes on with her business, not knowing what was in the right hand. What if the person over here doesn't get nothing? Doesn't make a difference. The next person, if I gave them a $20 bill, it's still no difference. The gift amount may have changed. But still, you had to do nothing to receive it. So I want to talk about something. If I gave you a million dollars, would you take it? Yep. <laughs> Why? Because it's free? Because it's free? So if I had a bunch of stipulations and things you didn't agree with, I, I don't know. I might still think it's a million dollars. She said maybe. Maybe. <laughs> a million dollars. Okay. So, <coughs> what about a job? <coughs> what if I came and I offered you a job? Uh, I gave you a career. Free. Came with retirement. Came with paid training. Came with excellent teamwork. Would you take it? You don't have to worry about not knowing what's going on or what your job will be. I promise. Everything will be figured out. It will be paid training. You'll have the best teamwork. I can guarantee your team will be a solid team. Would you take it? Would you at least be willing to try? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you'd be willing to take a million dollars if it's free. You'd be willing to take a good job with retirement and good teamwork and paid vacation and all these benefits. Or at least you'd be willing to try. Okay. 
Well, let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says that salvation is a free gift of God. Not of works. So as I look around, I want to ask, why pass this up? Why would you choose to pass something up that is free? Why would you choose to pass something up that has so much value? If you want to turn up a million dollars that's free, you wouldn't turn down that job. You have nothing to lose. If I offer you a million dollars and you don't take it, you're not in a worse situation now than where you were. Nothing's changed, right? Man, God is offering us something very, very special. Something far more worthy than a million dollars. And so many of us don't grab on to it, even though it's free. If I offered you a job and I said, don't worry about being qualified. There'll be training along the way. You'll have a teamwork. You'll have a phenomenal boss that knows exactly what he's doing. You said, I'd give it a try. Well, let me point something out to you. God is trying to get you involved in his work. He's trying to get you involved in his business. Jesus Christ said, I got to be about my father's business. The God of the universe is calling you by name to be involved with his business. And it's far worth more than a million dollars, church. It comes with retirement. Not in this life, but the life to come. Christ will come back and receive us under his own and give us a, an inheritance, a retirement, if you will, that is non-perishable. Talking about feeling qualified. And we're going to get on to the message, but I want to point something out. We feel, feel qualified. If somebody came and offered you a lawyer job, would you take it? Probably not. Because you'd be like, I'm not qualified. If I said, I got a job for you, and I know you don't know much now, but I will train you all the way through, and you will be perfect at what you do. If you just follow my direction and follow the direction of the boss. Man, God is calling us to get involved in his business and he promised to give us the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, direct us, and train us. He's trying to give us a job, but he doesn't just say, here's your job title, now go figure it out. He's calling us to serve him in his kingdom and he's promising to give us his spirit to lead us and guide us. We don't have to figure this out all by ourselves. If you want to turn down a million dollars and you want to turn down this good opportunity for the rest of your life and the life, uh, then why do you reject what God is trying to give to you? Why would you pass this up? If I said, here's a million dollars, you want it? And you say, no, I don't want that. It's free, man. Take it. I don't want it. The dude next to you is going to say, you're crazy. Why would you not take that? Church... What God is offering us, the free gift of salvation. I'm standing up here telling you that God is offering it to you. And I'll stand up here, look you in the face and call you crazy if you reject that. It's a free gift. Why pass this up? Why pass what up? A million dollars? No, let's get away from the money. Let's get away from the job. Let's get away from materialistic things so we can get an understanding of what God is truly trying to offer us as a free gift. His guidance, church. He's offering his guidance. He said, I won't leave you as an orphan. We can go back to Isaiah where he said in Isaiah 30, 21, he said you would hear a voice behind you telling you, go to the left, go to the right, go this way, go that way. God said he would lead us down a path of righteousness for his name's sake. He is offering you his guidance, church. Why pass that up? 
Are you tired of trying to figure things out? Are you tired of not having all the answers? Are you tired of not knowing what to do? Are you tired of doing what you think you should do and it not turning out right? What was the Bible verse again? That one was uh, Isaiah what? 3021. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was wrong. Why would you pass that up? Man, so many of us are tired of wandering around, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to do it. God promises to guide us. The Bible says, lean not on thy own understanding, but acknowledge God and he'll direct your path. Why would you pass his guidance up? We may desire the direction of God, but when we choose to live how we want, rather than how his word tells us to, we tell God, I don't want your guidance. I think I can figure this out. I'm going to put myself on the throne and figure it out. Why would you pass up the Lord Almighty's guidance? If you had a leak under your house and you called the plumber and the plumber showed up, would you crawl under the house and tell the plumber he's doing his job wrong? No. Would you follow him under the house and no. tell him that he missed a tool or he didn't buy the right part? Or would you just trust that he knew what he was doing under the house and wait till he's done? Trust. God is calling us to trust in his guidance, trust in his faithfulness and his goodness. So why are we constantly telling him how he's doing his job wrong? Why are we constantly complaining about how hard things are? We should just let the plumber be the plumber. We should let the mechanic be the mechanic and we should let God be God. Why would you pass his guidance up? Not only his guidance, church. How many of you have ever been into debt before? Five dollars? Come on. I look around. I know we all used to bet on football games when we were in the world. We used to bet on some worldly things. Come on. We all lost five dollars. We all lost a dollar. Sad things to say, some of us lost a lot more than five dollars. But the fact is, we all understand what it means to be in debt. And I want you to understand something, church. Did you like being in debt? I don't like it to this day. Do you, no. Did you like the authority that that other person had over you because you were in debt? You felt like you owed them something. Mm -hmm. And that you could never make up that. Man, church, I want you to understand that we were in debt to God because of sin. I don't know how much debt you owe. How would it have made you feel if the person that you owe the debt to said, you know what? Your debt is clear. You don't, you don't owe me a dollar. You don't owe me a penny. I forgive you. Can we start over new? Can we start over afresh? It's about seven years, but then it is. Can we just start over? Man, I've seen some really good friendships break over some debts. I've seen some families split over some debts. And y'all ever hear this before? It's not the amount. It's the principle of the amount. <laughs> y'all ever hear that? Y'all ever hear that? It wasn't the fact it was only a dollar. It was the fact of the matter. I'm okay? guilty of saying that. We all are. The fact is, here's the thing, church. You were born into a debt. And there is no amount of money, there is no position you can have, there is no possession you can gain that God is willing to take on the behalf of a payment of your debt. We talked about how much we would enjoy if the person we owed a debt to came and said, you're forgiven. The Lord God Almighty, the one who sits on the throne above all, looked down upon us with compassion and said, you know what? I'm going to make a way for your debt. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says that the debt that we owed was nailed to the cross. If you would like your human person that you were in debt with to come and forgive you, if he has come to forgive you and he says, I know you owe me $500, but I'm going to just clear your debt. You'd be excited. Okay. What if he said, I know you have a 
$500 trillion debt, and you still don't owe me a penny. You might still be excited, but you definitely ain't going to turn around and say, no, I want to pay you. Would you? No. So, if you were in a $500 million, trillion dollar debt, and they said, you're forgiven, you don't owe me a penny, would you turn around and say, well, you can have my house, my car, my family, uh, my life, um, and everything else you want to pay my debt? No. Then why do we continue to do that with God? Why would you pass this up? God says, I've taken your debt of sin and I've nailed it to the cross. I have taken your old, dirty, sinful lifestyle and made you born again in my spirit. Why would you pass that up? If you wouldn't look that man in the face and say, no, I want to pay you this immeasurable debt that I'll never be able to pay, so please keep me in debt. Why would you look God in the face and say, I know you have redeemed me from this debt, but I still want to go and be part of it. He has redeemed us from sin, church. Why would you pass up debt free? Amen. Why would you pass that up? God is offering us a way to be debt free to Him. Why would you pass that up? How many of you have ever been in trouble before? Maybe even with just your mama. You don't have to be in legal trouble. But how many of you have ever been in trouble? Let's be honest. Come on, we can all raise our hand and say that we've been in trouble. <laughs> have you ever gotten in trouble with a friend and as soon as y'all both got in trouble, your friend was nowhere to be found? <laughs> yep. They just ran past her. Okay. Have you ever had a person that you did not know Show up to your courtroom and say, I know that person did what they did, but can I go to jail? Nope. <laughs> Has that ever happened? I've been in prison, I promise you. Nobody showed up to my courtroom saying I want to go. When I got my charges, nobody said, oh, I want those. Can those go on my record? I don't want that man to be a felon for the rest of his life. Can I do it? That happened to any of you? Yeah, I Basically, William's taking all the charges for me on the show. So if he's going to go to prison, that doesn't sound right. That, that doesn't sound right. The fact is, here's the thing. Jesus had no part whatsoever. Do you understand that if you're in trial for your actions and a man walks up the street and says, I had no part in this, I want his debt, can you let him go? That's exactly what happened with us and God and Jesus. Jesus had no part in our sin. He is not guilty. The Bible says that there was not even deceit upon his lips. That means what he said he meant and what he meant he said and there was no deceit, no manipulation. It was all 100% true. 2 Corinthians 5.21 It says that he who knew no sin became our sin. That man that had no wrongdoing walked up off the streets, looked the judge in the face and said, I'll take his punishment. Let him go free. Let him go as a man that committed no crime. And the judge says, okay, the consequence of sin is death. And you know what? Our sin killed the Savior of the world. Our sin is what put the Messiah on the cross. He had no partaking in the sin. He had no partake whatsoever. And yet he stood before the Almighty God and he said, I'll take their punishment. I'll clear their debt. Let them go. Let them go as a free man. Let them uphold the righteousness that they now have because I have become their sin. You want to be righteous before God? You want to be able to stand before the judge with a clear record? Or do you want to have to stand before God and answer for all your dirty secrets? Are you going to want to stand before God and ask or answer why this debt has not been paid? How would that make you feel? How would that make you feel? Let's put this in a perspective, okay? How would that make you feel if somebody 
owed you some money. They owed you some money, and you're like, man, you know you owe me some money. And they're like, I don't have no money to owe you. I don't have any. And you're like, okay, well, your debt is still here. And somebody comes up during that conversation while you two are talking and they say, hey, I know this man right here owes you some money. Here, man, here's the money. Pay off your debt. If that guy refused the debt payment, even though the dude who needs the debt is standing there, how do you think that'd make you feel? You owe me money. You just had an opportunity to receive it for free and you still won't pay me? How would you feel? Come on, we all know how it feels for somebody to do something they should do and they don't. We all know how it feels for somebody that should pay you back and you know they have the means to and they don't. I was talking to a sister earlier and she said, man, people have a way of just stepping on people's kindness, right? That's another way to word it. Have you ever experienced that? How do you think God Almighty feels when He Himself has made a way for the debt to be paid and you reject it? That's like me saying, hey, Catherine, I know you owe me $20, but instead of you giving me $20, I'm going to give Maria $20 to give to you so you can pay to me. It'll work, though. It'll work. So if I gave this, so if I gave this $20 to my wife and said, hey, go give this to Catherine so she can pay the debt to me, and she goes over there and says, hey, Catherine, here's your debt to pay to Joseph. Go take this over there now. And you're like, I don't want that. I'll pay him another way. Okay, well, when you have to come answer why you don't have the money and the debt's not paid anymore, I'm going to be a lot more angry when I myself made a way for you to get out. Right. I didn't leave it up to you to figure it out by yourself. And now you have to answer why you couldn't figure it out. I made the way for you to clear your debt with me, and yet you still reject it. How much more angry would you be? Really angry? Why would you pass that up? You're in debt to God, yet God made a way for your debt to be clear. And if you reject Jesus Christ, you're rejecting God's payment of your debt. That's right. He's going to be one angry God. Why would you pass that up? So you not only got guidance, you not only got direction. You not only got freedom from your debt. Why would you pass that up? He offers so much more than just these things. He offers peace. How many of you need peace in your life? Why would you pass that up? He offers joy. Why would you pass that up? He offers self-control and patience and forgiveness and gentleness. Why would you pass that up? I know why. Because you're worried about the here and now. You're worried about the comfort of here and now. You're worried about a solution now. But let me ask you what Jesus asked in the Gospels. He said, what is the point of gaining the whole world if you lose your soul? What's the point of having all the relationships and all the money and all the possessions and all the stuff? What's the point of living carefree in this life if you lose your soul? Why pass it up? So, this might work with children, right? This doesn't work with adults very much anymore, so I want to put something into perspective for you, okay? If you hand a little child $21 bills and you also hand them a $50 bill <laughs> 9 times out of 10 they're going to take the $20 bills instead of the one yep. it's just because of things the way they work it like it's just more. because it looks like more just because it feels like more yep. okay. well I want to point something out to you church God is offering you a free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and the world is offering you a bunch of $1 bills that could never match up to that. And yet we're going around trying to grab all these dollar bills because we think it's a lot. We think it's worth something. 
Why gain the whole world if you're going to lose your soul? You see, God is offering us so much more than what we could ask or imagine. And so I want to read our next main scripture. I'm just going to read this. And I'm going to go back to the question that I asked. We're going to be in Revelations chapter 21. Because it's not God's will that any man should perish. God doesn't want you to burn in hell. God made a way for your debt to be paid. Why would you pass that up? Because you want pleasure? Because you want comfort? Because you want position? Because you want possessions? Come on church, that's like $10, $1 bills. Grab onto the one single dollar bill that God is trying to offer you. That is a measure. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. There is no longer any sea. Before we continue reading, I feel the Lord say right now that that is the exact drastic change that He wants to make in your life. One of the biggest drastic changes on this earth that you could see is if one day we woke up and there was no more ocean. If we woke up and there was no more ocean, I guarantee every single person on this planet would notice. Yeah. God just said the new heavens and the new earth will not have an ocean. That same exact drastic change that we would all notice on this earth is the same exact drastic change that God wants to put inside of your life that everyone would notice. He said you are a light that is put on a lampstand to light the whole house. You are a city set on a hill. Drastic, noticeable change. Don't limit God. Why would you pass that up? Let's continue reading. He goes on to say, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. Now let's stop. Continue to read, but let's stop. How many of you have read about the Garden of Eden? Adam, Eve, talked about how God walked in the coolness of the breeze with them. How cool would that be to walk in the presence of God, in the tangibility of His glory, in this beautiful garden. When you read that, have you ever imagined just being there of the peace and the smells and maybe the beauty? God is telling us something here. God is telling us that He has a plan to one day come back and dwell among men. To take his original plan of Garden of Eden, of him dwelling with his people. He says, And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. How many of you have ever cried? How many of you have ever been in pain? How many of you have ever had your heart break? How many of you have ever been backstabbed, gossiped about, lied about? Uh, you name it. He says, I'll wipe every tear away from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He offers his guidance now. He offers his love now. He offers his mercy and his forgiveness now. But he offers so much more than that, church. The Bible says because the joy that was set before the Lord, he was able to endure the cross. He has given us a little sneak peek through the little locket on the door to say, let's look into what your future beholds. He said, your tears will be wiped away. You'll have no more pain. You'll have no more death. You'll have no more sorrow, no more crying, no more nothing. 
that this world brings to us that is painful. So now that we've read God's ultimate plan to fully redeem us, to wipe away our tears, to take away our pain, to truly give us a new identity in His presence forever, leads me to my first question. <coughs> Why would you pass this up? <coughs> Why would you pass this up? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, said that salvation is a free gift of God. That no man may boast. Church, we just read a little bit about salvation. That when we are fully transformed and met in the sky and our new home is brought down to us, our tears will be wiped away. All our pain will be gone. All our heartbreak will be removed. You see, church, but if we want this, there's only one way to receive that. There's only one way to receive a guarantee that when Christ comes, we'll go with it. It's repentance, church. It's repentance, church. We must truly repent and believe and follow the Son of God if we want to go with Him when He returns. And so, why would you pass that up? It's a free gift of God. Because you don't want to change? Because you got to put in some work? Because you got to put in some effort? Don't gain the whole world and lose your soul, church. So here's the thing. Repentance is a very big word that I feel is misused. It's, it's watered down. It's talked about. Uh, it's, it's even used in some churches that don't even believe in repentance just because they know it sounds right and they'll pull in some people. I want to tell you what repentance is and we're going to leave with this because repentance is the only way we truly receive this. And why would you pass it up? So repentance, people say, it's doing a 180. Maybe. Maybe. Really what I come to understand repentance to be is a change of mind. You change your mind about things. When you repent of sin, you have changed your mind about sin. When you repent of sin, you now get a proper perspective of sin. That the consequence of sin is death. You say, I don't want to do something that's going to lead to death. You get a proper understanding that sin hurts our Father's heart and it grieves His spirit. And so we don't want to grieve Him. We get a different perspective. Maybe we used to be real abusive and aggressive to our spouses. When we repent of that, that means that you get a changed state of mind of who your spouse is. So you treat them differently. You see, there's a lot of people that I've, I've come to know that have cleaned up their life. They laid down the bottle. They laid down the needle. They did these things, and they cleaned up. That doesn't make them right. There's only one way to the Father. There's only one way to receive the ultimate outcome of a pain-free, tear-free life. And that's following the Son of God. It is being born again and following the Spirit of Christ. I don't know why you would pass this up. So ask yourself, why would I pass this up? What is, what is in my life right now that is so important to me that even if I had it for another hundred years, it's still more important than losing my soul? I'd give you $10 million for the rest of your life. Still ain't getting into heaven. Only Jesus gets us into heaven, church. But he also doesn't play games. He is the Lord God Almighty. And he is calling us to truly repent and follow his spirit. He says, who who began a good work in you 
shall see it until the end. In Philippians 4.13, right? I do all things through God, through Christ who strengthens me. Why would you pass that up? So if you don't know Christ today, if you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, right now is the opportunity. Ask yourself, why am I passing this up? Why am I passing up the payment of my debt towards God? Why am I passing up the guidance that He offers me? Why am I passing up the peace and the joy and the love He offers? Why am I passing up? These things. So I'll leave with this. I'm going to end with this. When I said earlier that you get employed by God and you get to develop a teamwork, I meant the body of Christ. Those of us who are already part of the body, I encourage you to get more involved with the body. Develop relationships with those within the body. And learn to use each other's gifts for the edification of each other. Jesus loves you. I love you. Amen. I'm so glad that you guys are here. What God is offering us is a free gift. We may have to do some things. But nothing, I promise you, nothing in this earth will compare to what He has planned for us. And there is no process that will ever outweigh the beauty of the outcome. I'm going to say that again. There is no process that will outweigh the beauty of the outcome. So continue to push forward. Continue to trust the Lord. Continue to draw unto Him so He can draw unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.